Good morning, church family. How are you doing today? Are you doing okay? Good. Man, it's great to see you. My name is Josh. I'm one of the ministers. If we have not yet met, I would love to get to know you after service today. Just so glad to be together. There are moments where there's just the sweetness of presence and being with each other. And uh, so if I get teary-eyed today, it's uh, fall allergies, okay? That's all it is. But I love you guys so much. And to all of our friends joining us online around the city, around the states, and yes, even as we've said last week around the world, welcome. We love you. So glad that you're with us. And we pray that God will bless you through your time with us as well. As you have probably noticed, and we all have been keeping up with the news, Hurricane Ian has come ashore. It hit, obviously, Florida in particular, Cuba as well, and some of the other states. Before we go into any of our how great God is, about our lives, it is important for the church to pray for those who are suffering. Amen? And so we want to lift up our brothers and our sisters who have been affected by the hurricane, certainly for those who may not yet know Christ, that through this Christ would be seen as good and his body a blessing to them. We especially want to pray for the families who have lost loved ones. I may be behind, but the last I heard was there have been 70 people who died in this hurricane. There may be more at this point. And that's someone's friend or family member, so we want to lift them up. So if you will, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you hear us when we pray, and that you are not a distant God, but you are a here God and a there God, meaning when we pray here, you're already there. We ask that you will comfort those who are grieving the loss of their homes, businesses, the loss of normalcy, the loss of loved ones. As I spoke to with a dear friend after first service, it is such a comfort to remember that Jesus wept even though he knew how he was going to fix everything. So we just thank you for being the God who weeps, but also the God who heals. So we ask that you be present. Comfort the families, provide for them. And as we as a church um, multiply our efforts by, by supporting certain organizations that will be boots on the ground there, I pray that those efforts will bless many and help them. We love you, Jesus. And now as we open your word, Holy Spirit, show us what we need to see so that we can be who you've called us to be. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. All right, I want to begin this morning as we're diving into the next portion of our teaching, God Wins, the book of Revelation. We've been in it now four weeks. This is our fifth week. Don't worry, we are over a third of the way through now. You say, how is that possible? There's so many more chapters. We're about to move fast. And there's a lot to cover. We're going to try to do a good job. But here's what I want to do. Now that you've had a few weeks thinking about Revelation, I want you to turn to a neighbor and answer this question. Here's the question. Share one word that you'd use to describe the book of Revelation at this point. What one word? And if you're like, I don't even know, that's fine. Say, I don't know. You have 10 seconds. Share a word with those around you that defines the book of Revelation. Ready? Go. Go. All right, let's start here. Raise your hand if your answer was something related to or like, I don't know. All the honest people in here, I love you so much. Thank you, that's good. All right, someone call out, what is one word that comes to mind when you think of the book of Revelation? Just call it out. Over here, what was it? Winning. Can I hear an amen? Yeah, I love it. Earlier today, someone said, we win, and I thought they said the weekend And I thought, well, yeah, sure, that's a great winning day. Good, good, good. Let me give you a few words that I heard from some people as I pulled them. And these were some of the words. Majesty, revealing, mysterious, apocalyptic, endure, unexpected, symbolic. Ooh, what about that one? Hopeful, courage, unveiling, the letters, right? Victory, bittersweet. Anyone else, you just read this, you kind of, oh, you get homesick for heaven. And if not, my hope is that by the end of today you will. But I'll tell you, of all these words, as beautiful as these are, there's one word, before I put it up, there's just one word that I hope at the end of this teaching, not today, but through this series, that you will just go, yes. The one word that I believe encapsulates the book of Revelation is this word, worship. You say, how's that possible? I thought it was about 666, the mark of the beast, the 144,000. By the way, we're going to get into the 144,000 next week and the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse. (laughs) It's going to be interesting. But everything in this book ultimately comes down to this one word. And by the way, everything in your life comes down to this one word as well. 
It's a punchline. We're going to look at two chapters, chapter 4 and 5. Chapter 4 is God is on the throne. And what does creation do because he's on the throne? Worship. Chapter 5, we will then see who is at the center of human history. Who is the one who is going to complete the task, fulfill the plan of God, and bring salvation to all who will accept him? Those are the two chapters. And by the way, when we see God on the throne, there's worship. When we see Jesus, hint, hint, he's the one, there will be worship because everything is about worship. And so with that, let's begin. Revelation chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, says, After this I, who's I? This is John. He's the apostle who's been exiled to this little itty-bitty rock in the middle of the Aegean Sea called Patmos. And it is here that Christ appears and begins to give him a vision, a revelation of what is to come. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. I'm about to have a vision, he says. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, that was Jesus, who sounded like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, John is about to try and describe the indescribable. And he's going to use all sorts of pictures and images and metaphors to help us understand what we on our own cannot understand. But here's what I'm going to try to do to help us. As I read these few verses, we're going to put a little music underneath it. We do this from time to time. So that way, as we hear the words, we hopefully will not simply hear words, but experience the reality of those words. And so here's all we're going to do. We're going to play this music, and as we do, try to help us understand this incomparable moment. Are you ready? Here we go. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Now just think about how would you describe the living God John says it's hard. So he uses precious stones to describe his beauty and a rainbow to describe God's mercy. He continues, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seating on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. These represent the faithful of God through human history, 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, 12 apostles in the New dressed in white, for Christ has made them clean, crowns on their head, for they will rule for eternity. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne were what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. That number seven, it means perfect. This is the Holy Spirit of God who is always present and always with us. There were flashes of lightning because what we will read in the coming weeks will shake creation to its core. And in the center around the throne were four living creatures with the appearance of animals and men. These represent God's creation. For all creation worships God. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it's not just them who worship. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Listen, no matter who you are, you owe your very existence to God Almighty. When John sees the throne room of heaven, the universe displayed, he sees that the worship of God is the heartbeat of the cosmos. And the day will come when God makes everything new, my friends. Yes, there is evil today. Yes, there are forces who oppose God and hate God, and we have been a part of it. But John says, no more. There will come a day when Christ makes everything new. The world is broken. Evil hates God. But we see in this moment that God is on the throne. And did you catch that little detail? A sea of glass still. The sea was symbolic of evil and destruction and chaos. It's where evil comes from. This is where we will see in the coming chapters where the beast comes from. God is admitting that there is evil, but he is showing us that it is still because God is on his throne and he will deal with evil once and for all. 
This means that God rules. And I just have to ask, is there something for some of us who are in our own chaos storm, the waters are coming over the edge, and we just don't know what to do about what's happening to us. In this moment, God says, I'm still here, and I'm on the throne. This is the image of worship in heaven. Do you see how everything comes from the posture of worship? You are not alone. God is in control. Amen. So if all of creation is worshiping God, maybe we should join them for a moment. What do you say? Would you join me? Let's stand. Let's sing this song together. whole church said Amen. grab a seat so here we are chapter 4 it is the worship of God creation itself worships him by the way did you notice that number 4 for creation why is 4 associated with creation well we talk about four elements at least the ancient people did earth wind water fire we also talk about the four corners of the earth in other words, four is symbolic for all of creation. And the 24 elders, symbolic of all believers throughout history, celebrating Jesus and celebrating his Father, our God. That's chapter four. Chapter five, are you ready? The worship of God leads into the plan of God. And he's going to show us now that God, yes, he's on the throne, but something has gone fundamentally wrong and so there is now need for a solution notice what it says then I saw in the right hand of him who's the him on the throne church God in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals here's the simplest way to understand this this simply represents God's plan to fix everything the scroll the seven seals why seven Again, seven symbolizes perfection. It's not simply that God has a plan. This is God's perfect plan. You can't improve on it. And do you notice, where is he holding this scroll? Do you notice? In his right hand. Because the right hand is symbolic of power. This is God's perfect, powerful plan to fix everything. This is what we've just witnessed. 
But now, there's a little bit of a problem. Did you know there's a problem here? Let me illustrate this or demonstrate this uh, by a little conversation. I want you to talk to each other now, and here's the question I want you to discuss. Have you ever just, have you ever bought the cheaper imitation of something because it was cheaper? Anyone else in here willing to admit to that? Let's just see some honesty this morning. Oh yeah, God's people. Mm -hmm. So here's what I want you to do. Go ahead, next slide. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Next slide. Turn to your neighbor and share a time you chose the imitation version of an item you and you regretted it. So this could be something that you bought. This could be something you did. It could be someplace you went. Whatever it is, share a time that you did something imitation-wise and you regretted it. Are you ready? Mass confession moment. Go for it. You've got 10 seconds. All right. So I'm not going to ask you to share what you wish you had not done. We won't do that. Instead, let's just do a few of these. Um, this one we saw in Israel. It turns out that you don't just have to have Starbucks. If you want something else, you can have Stars and Bucks coffee or Square Bucks coffee. This was, we saw both of these. And guess what? They're both equally underwhelming. Yes, no joke. Or what about this one? Who doesn't want a nice, cool, refreshing glass of Dr. Bob's? Mmm. You gotta love the tagline. Open wide and say, ah. Uh. Let me give you one more. How about this? Who doesn't want a half-eaten can of original Prongles chips? Is that, by the way, is that Timon or Pumbaa or something on there? Anyone else? But my very favorite one, are you ready? My all-time favorite is the Revengers. Not the Avengers, but the Revengers. Endless tussle. You too can buy your very own version of the incredible fella. Now, come on. <laughs> Sermon preparation is a lot of fun sometimes. Here's the thing. When it comes to cheap imitations, we've all fallen for it, haven't we? Sometimes it, the stakes are so low, it really doesn't matter. Then there are other times... Stakes matter a lot, don't they? And we get suckered into something thinking it will be better, and yet we enter into it and we end up missing out greatly or we end up wrecking our lives because we chose a cheap imitation. Here's why I'm telling you this. There is one on the throne. There is one with a plan, but there are others who are merely cheap imitations saying we've got a better one. And for you and I to capture and really kind of get between our ears all the symbolism we have seen and we'll see for the rest of our reading, you need to know about one individual. We've talked about him already, but let's go back and look at this very important late first century character, Emperor Domitian. Domitian was the emperor over the Roman Empire. It was the preeminent empire. Everyone else paled in comparison. And he was the head honcho, the leader of the leaders. The problem was, as we've already said, Domitian was an evil, insecure, vindictive man. He was so mean and so evil that when he died, Caesars that came after him celebrated that he was dead. Can you imagine being so bad that the people who come after you are just like, man, let's kick some more dirt on that grave? He was horrible, but part of what made him bad is he wanted to be worshipped as God. Now, by the time he came along, this was already creeping into the, the, the greater Roman culture where they would worship Caesar as God, but usually they would wait until the Caesar died. He couldn't wait that long. He's like, you worship me now. In fact, you want to know what he had his wife call him? He made his wife call him my Lord and my God. By the way, we don't, we don't teach any of that in our premarital classes here at Clear Creek, okay? He wanted to be called God. Now, let me give you some things that may sound a little familiar. Did you know that Caesar had 24 guards who would follow him wherever he went? They would surround and protect him. He had priests dressed in white with gold crowns who would accompany him to athletic games and he came upon and would force poets to write things about him, things like, you are worthy of glory and honor and power 
and praise forever and ever. Does this sound familiar at all, church, to what we just read? One more detail. Do you notice what's in his right hand? What is that? It's a scroll. This was the symbol of his power, for on that scroll was his name and his decrees and the authority he had to rule. He was the option on earth, and everyone thought he was the option. But John gets a picture to see that he is nothing more than a cheap imitation of the one who does sit on the throne. In fact, let's just go through it again. So Domitian, you see him. Let's look at God. God is not simply demanding worship, but creation voluntarily celebrates that you are the Lord God Almighty. You're not a God. You are the God. And not only are you the God, 24 elders surround you. Why elders and not guards? Because God doesn't need protection by those who he has created, does he? And we're told that they are dressed in white because we have been washed new. There are crowns on their heads, for they will reign with him forever. You now have creation singing, you are worthy of praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. Amen. And in his right hand is the scroll, not a scroll, but the scroll, not with one seal, but with seven seals. It is God's perfect plan. Friends, do you see how evil always tries to mimic what is good? Now, if we wanted to, it'd be easy pickings to look at cultural moments and see how good and evil are often flipped and how evil is called good and good is called evil. But I don't have to go there because you know that is true, don't you? But what I want you to see is everything is about worship. And there's a whole bunch of little Domitians running around. Maybe they don't sit on a throne, but there's a Domitian who likes to sit on the throne of my heart. This is the Domitian that says, you are deserving of honor, Josh. You are deserving of respect. You are this. You are that. It's the Domitian that I am so tempted to listen to and bow down to. It's the Domitian that promises to provide for me when I am not confident God can. Does anyone else know a Domitian in their life? And don't nudge anyone, okay? That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? But it's all about worship. And so God presents this plan. It's his plan to fix all that is broken But there's this moment of terror that comes upon John in the next verse. Look at what it says here. Verse 2. And I saw a mighty angel and proclaiming, proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. But notice this. But no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. In other words, it didn't matter who it was. No one above, no one with us, no one below was capable of opening the scroll. What does this mean? God has a plan to fix what is wrong. Do you know anyone able to fulfill it perfectly? I mean, come on, let's just take a poll here. If God Almighty rolls into your bedroom tonight and says, I've got a plan, I want you to fulfill it, but here's the catch, you've got to be perfect. How many of us are already disqualified? What if he then says, uh, and by the way, it's not only that you have to be perfect, like avoid all the bad things, you must fulfill everything perfectly as well. How are we doing there? Or he says, and then, and then you need to be able to demonstrate my power through you, heal the sick, raise the dead, Give sight to the blind. How are we rolling there, family? And then, when you are completely abandoned, I want you to give your life while people spit on you and your friends have run away. There's no one who could carry the weight of that. And so John, when he realized this, in verse 3 says this, I wept and wept Because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or even look inside. Now that phrase, I wept and wept, is way too soft. Do you want to know what this really refers to? It refers to a primal scream. It's that, no! It's the moment when you open your door at 2 a.m. and there are the policemen and the chaplain. And before the words are off their tongue, you know what's happened and you just scream, no! It's the parents who stand there watching as the casket comes off the plane draped in the American flag and they crumple and say, no. It's those of you who've had that heartbreaking moment where you read the note or you see the empty closet and you know they're gone and you say, no. He cries 
out, not a little bit of tears, but this heart-wrenching ache because there is no one who can fix what is broken. Friends, the reason this world is so busted and the reason people are in such despair is because when you get that the world is broken and that there is no one on earth who can fix it, what is left but despair? And he weeps. But then, one of the elders says, do not fear, do not worry, do not weep. Why? See, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, this, these phrases, Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, these are Old Testament titles for the Messiah, for who Jesus would be. Our family right now is reading through this wonderful series of children's books, The Chronicles of Narnia. By the way, read the books, not the movies. The books, they're good. The movies, wow. How many of you know Aslan, the lion, in The Chronicles of Narnia? Mm. The lion of Judah. I mean, how many of us, when we say, I need someone who can take care of me, and there's an animal that symbolizes what I need, how many of us are like, yes, a lion? I mean, we're not going over here saying, I need a sloth. I, I need a caterpillar. I need a sheep. we talked about those before, haven't we? Yeah. The lion. I need the power of God to fix what is broken. You need the power of God to fix what is broken. There is nothing within your power, friend, with all respect, and nothing in my power to fix what is broken. But the elder says there is one who can. There is one who not only can, but do you notice it is he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So John excited in this moment. Can you imagine? He's like, well, show me the lion. And so when he turns, what does he see? I saw a lamb. Wait, what? I thought I was getting a lion, but I get a lamb? I need a lion. I don't need lamb chops. By the way, it's even worse than this. It's, it's not even lamb. There are two Greek words for lamb. This is the word for little lamb or baby lamb. This isn't even a big one. This is like just this weak little infant. And that word slain, that's too tame. The better translation would be slaughtered or mutilated. I think Jesus turns and he hears about this line, but he turns and he sees a vision of his best friend on the cross, torn to shreds, and his synapses just explode. And you got to understand, one of the things, one of the problems, the reason we are so tempted to worship a Domitian and not God is because Domitian shows up with force. Jesus shows up with self-sacrificing love. And we go, this can't, this can't fix anything. Don't you know that the world is run by the powerful? Don't you know that the world is fixed by those who rule with an iron fist? And God says, my plan, my plan is different from anyone else. Yes, he is a lion. Yes, he has all power. But he does not come on the scene to destroy and to devour. And I know for a lot of us, for me especially, there are moments where I'll be like, God, why don't you just come and obliterate the evil? Why don't you just come and get rid of it all? Why don't you just fix it, be done with it? Why didn't you come and tamp out evil? And it's in this moment that God says, Joshua, if I had come to destroy all that was evil and not die for it, I would have to destroy you as well because you were living an evil life. The reason God gives us the lamb is because you and I need forgiveness. We need someone to take the pain, the blame, and the sin on himself. And yes, he is the lion. He will deal with evil, but he does so by taking it on his shoulders. Praise be to God, you and I don't have to carry our sin any longer. The plan of God that he begins to open and over the next weeks we will see unfold is his plan of promise that he will take the poison and he will give us life. He is on his throne and he is the only one capable of fulfilling the plan. And so what happens next? Standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures, the lamb is there. You say, wait, I thought God was on the throne in the center, and, but Jesus is in the center. It's almost like the Father and the Son are both God. Almost as though we do not worship a mere mortal, but God incarnate. He goes on. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. And you just read that and go, what does that even mean? Seven horns. Horns, symbol of power. There's seven, so it's perfect. He has all power. Seven eyes. He can see all things. 
listen to me. You may think he doesn't see you, but you are not ignored by God. He knows you, friend. He comes as a lamb, but he retains his power. And this vision continues with these words. Next slide. He says, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures, all of creation, and the 24 elders, all of the faithful, fall down before the Lamb. Because when you have experienced the grace of God, you don't beat your chest and say, look how good I am. You say, how great thou art. You give me life. There's nothing I can do but crumple and say, thank you. Praise you, God. It is all about worship. So here's the point. Are you ready? Domitian ruled through force and fear. But God's plan through Jesus is that God would give himself through sacrificial love. But Josh, love doesn't fix anything. Have you not watched the headlines? Love doesn't fix what is broken. Have you seen what's going on around us? We need someone who is powerful and forceful. And the God of the universe says, that's Domitian talking. What you desperately need is the sacrificial love of God because only that can change the heart, which changes families, which changes neighborhoods, cities, countries, and the world. It is only the power of God through Jesus' sacrifice that can save us from our sins and bring us to Him. This is His plan. And at this moment, all of creation celebrates and sings. And we come to this moment at the very end of the end in verse 13 Verse 8, rather, it says, Each had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. We'll talk about that next week. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. With your blood, you, uh, with your blood, you purchased for God persons. Keep going here. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And the rest of chapter 5 is like a bad Broadway musical. Every time you turn around, a keyboard or piano comes out, and they begin to do another number. People burst out into song, because when you see the risen Savior, you can do nothing but celebrate Him and His goodness. And in verse 14, it says this final word. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Friends, here is the question. Who will you worship? There's the question. Will you worship Jesus? You say, Josh, what does that mean? Here's what worship means. It means all that you have is now His. It means where you go in life is His. What you want to do with your finances, it's his. How you raise your children, they're his. The way you honor your spouse or honor your singleness, that's all his, everything. Now that you have, you say, it is yours. That is how we worship. And so we today bow down and worship.